Okay. Uh, this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, we have with us Mr. Ted Kalicki. Ted was born in Buffalo, but raised here in Batavia. He was just telling me earlier he had the misfortune of living between Tom Rusica's house and Tom Rusica's uncle's house over on Swan Street. But, you know, I, I'm trying to figure out how you got someone with a Polish name living between two Italians, but, you know. Uh, when Ted was in high school, World War II broke out. He was too young to enlist in the American Army, decided to skip off to Canada. Uh, quite unlike what happened in Vietnam, people skipped off to Canada, but for, Ted went for a different reason. He joined the Canadian Army and fought in World War II as a paratrooper and uh, was involved as a paratrooper in the Normandy invasion. Uh, we had Sid Sherwin talking in one of the videos that we'd done a couple years ago about Pearl Harbor. Probably the other major event of World War II was the Normandy invasion, and we we're extremely fortunate to have Ted come in and can't go better than an eyewitness account of what happened over there. So let me turn it over to Ted. I asked him to do about half hour, 45 minutes, and open up the questions from the group. Ted? Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real honor for me to be here uh, to speak about D-Day. And it's not for me, but I'd like to get the word out for the thousands of young men, the flower of our youth in those days, who never lived through the first seconds or first minutes or hours of that day. Many of them, such as the airborne troops, their planes were blown out of the air, some were shot in their aircraft, Others were dropped over swampy areas and drowned. Never got to, never even got into combat. That happened all over. In the morning, after at daylight when they stormed the beaches, the landing craft came in. I don't know if you know what landing craft are. They had the big ramp. This is full of soldiers with all their gear on. And of course, this, these people guiding these craft in have got to get in and out to get more troops. So as quick as they can drop them off, that's what they do. And some of them, when they dropped their ramps, those poor GIs and Canadians and British, whatever they were, ran out into water six or seven feet deep. Never saw the light of day again with all their gear. They just couldn't get out. So there were many, many that participated in D-Day, but never even got started. And those are the ones that we like to remember. Uh, I ran away from home. Uh, during the Second World, before the Second World War, if you wanted to be a member of the Armed Forces, you had to be at least 21 years of age. That was the age of consent back then. Or you could be between 18 and 21 if you had your parents' consent. It's a long story how I got there, but the basic thing was I had an agreement with my father that when I gradu graduated from high school, he would sign my papers so I could become a Marine, which he agreed to do. That was back in 38. Lo and behold, when Pearl Harbor was attacked, my father completely changed his mind. He said he was no way was going to sign my papers. And I knew I wouldn't be drafted because they weren't drafting 18-year-olds. And I had two brothers older than me, so I knew they would be drafted before I was. My father was crippled, my mother was, wasn't well, so it was, there was a very slim chance that I would even get into the service. And I had based my whole life on becoming a Marine. So I was just shattered. So I, had, uh, I knew that there were people that had left the U U.S. and gone to Canada to join the Canadian Forces. So I thought that would be my next option. I took my January exams. Before I did, I, I talked this over with a very good friend of mine by the name of Henry Osses. Henry and I grew up together. We used to walk out, out here to Horseshoe Lake every day to go fishing, he and I. And uh, he became a, a bombardier and uh, he was in the Pacific Theater. He got shot down on the very last bombing grade in Japan. I saw him after I enlisted in the Canadian Army. I only saw him once. I met him in Batavia when I was home on a leave just before I went overseas, and that's the last time I saw him. It was a very good friendship. But that happened to many, many people. Anyway, I decided that I was going to go to Canada and enlist, and I told Henry this. 
And I made a promise not to say anything to anybody unless something serious happened. So he agreed. On a Friday night, I used to stick pins in the Mancusos. I don't know if you kids know what sticking pins is. Before they had these automatic machines, we used to have to, when the people bowled, we used to have to pick the pins up, throw them in the rack, set the rack. I used to take care of two alleys. We went down to Mancusos that night, got our pay for working during the week. A bunch of us went out to uh, Rippy's Diner, had something to eat, went to a movie. And some of the guys said, Ted, you going to Canada? I said, oh, yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> just they, didn't, they weren't sure, but they thought I might be because apparently they heard me talking. But I didn't tell any of them except Henry. So Saturday morning I got up, told my mother and dad I was going downtown, went down to the railroad station, which is down, well, used to be down here on Jackson Street where the Salvation Army building is now. That was the New York Central Station. You kids are too young to know, but we had a lot of trains going through this town back in those days. They were coming and going just like you wouldn't believe it. So you could catch a train out there just about any time of the day or night. I caught a train to uh, Niagara Falls. I had $12 in my pocket, which was quite a bit of money back then, believe it or not. You could buy a meal for 65 cents. I got to Niagara Falls, walked across the bridge, and I started to look for a recruiting station. And the recruiter there was a, quite an imbiber because I followed him from hotel to hotel to hotel. I was running behind him. He was stopping at each place for a beer, I guess. <laughs> but I finally caught up with him. It was late afternoon and uh, told him what I wanted to do. Well, we had quite a time. I lied about my age, told him I was 21. Of course, I was always a big kid. So he finally believed me, even though 18 was a legal age there, but he finally believed me that I was 21. And he signed me up. He said, when's the last time you ate? I said, well, I had breakfast this morning. So he said, well, come out, I'll buy you dinner. Took me to a hotel, bought me dinner. Then he put me on a train to Hamilton, Ontario. Now, prior to this, the farthest I had ever been away from home was Buffalo, Rochester. So here I am in a foreign country, which is just across the border, but it's still a foreign country. I know absolutely no one there. And he told me when I get to Hamilton, he said, you'll get off on James Street. Just start walking up the street, you'll find the armory there. So I did. When we got to Hamilton, I got off the train, walked out of the terminal. I walked up the street. I came, saw Bobby standing there, like the British police. That's the way they used to dress in Canada. And I asked him where the armory was, and he told me where it was. So I went there, got there. They were having a huge party there that night. The uh, dragoons were stationed in that armory, and they were having a big party. And the guard at the gate uh, said, wait here, I'll get somebody to escort you to one of the rooms. So he got a, uh, one of the soldiers to take me to a room up on the second floor. I got up there, there were six or seven other Americans there. And uh, he said the only reason they put us there rather than private rooms was because of the party. They didn't have room for us there. So we, we were, there was one fellow there from Louisiana, another one from Pennsylvania, one was from Texas, uh, one was from Ohio. And uh, we sat down, we started to play some cards. Pretty soon they came up with a couple of cases of beer and cold cuts, treating us. <laughs> Next morning, they uh, came in, got our names, fell us out on the parade square, issued us uh, food coupons to go to a local diner, because they said, you have to stay here till we get enough troops to send you up to Toronto to swear you in. So we were there about a week in Hamilton. Then they shipped us up to Toronto to the exhibition grounds, and we were in the horse palace. That's where they used to keep their horses to show, and that's where they kept the troops now. In fact. When the Queen of England had inspected the horse palace, she said she wouldn't allow her horses in that place, <laughs> but they put the men in there. <laughs> but anyway, that's where we were stationed. I was assigned to the Royal Canadian Ordnance Corps. And in March, one day we fell out on parade. They marched us to a railroad siding. And they started calling off the names. They said, as your name's called off, go to whichever car we tell you to, you're going overseas. So I was really happy finally going to get overseas. Well, they called my name, and when it came my name, the sergeant said, stand over there. So I stood aside. Everybody else boarded the train except me. And pretty soon the train's pulling out. I said to the sergeant, what's going on? He said, you can't go. I said, why not? He said, you're not old enough. I said, what do you mean I'm not old enough? He said, you're not 19 yet. Canada doesn't send any soldiers overseas until they're at least 19. And they never send anybody overseas unless they were volunteers. That was quite unique at that time. 
Well, believe it or not, these were the only people I knew in Canada, mind you. I had been with them for three months now, my good friends. I went back to that horse palace and I cried for two days. I was really lonesome. But then they assigned me to a unit that uh, we went to uh, Brampton, Ontario, to set up a tent camp for new recruits. And once we got the tent, set, tent camp set up, they asked us for volunteers to do certain things. They asked if anybody knew how to type, so I raised my hand. I figured that's going to be an easy job. So they took me aside and made me the company runner. I, did, I hadn't even seen a typewriter before, to be truthful. So I had to, I was assigned to the colonel's office so to put out the part two order. Now part two orders are what goes on for the camp during the whole next day, all the operations. We didn't have copy machines like you have now. We had the old mimeographs. And the sheet was about that long. It was coated with a wax substance. You had to type without the ribbon, and this would cut the wax, and you put it on a big drum and ink the drum, and then you roll these things off like a printing press. Well, I used to sit up till 2 o'clock in the morning, punching out those parts of orders with one finger <laughs> till I got so I could do it with four fingers. But I was glad I was in that position because I had the, I used to pick the mail up in town, and when I brought it back into the colonel's office, I would open all the mail except what was marked personal or secret or confidential. And then I had to distribute it throughout the camp. And one of the orders I picked up said that Canada was going to start a paratroop unit, and they were looking for volunteers. So I immediately went to the colonel and asked him if I could put my name in. He said, well, I think you're a little too tall. He said, they're very fussy on the size. I said, what size got to do with it? I don't know, but he says, they don't want people over six feet. Well, I was about six foot one then. So I, I talked to him for the whole day. He said, well, you put your name in, I'll sign it. But he said, you may get to Montreal and I'll ship you back. I said, well, I'll take my chances. So they finally got a group of us together and shipped us on to Montreal to the depot there. And sure enough, they gave me a hard time about my height. But I argued and pleaded, so they finally let me go through. We were there about a week until they got enough together. And then they shipped us to Fort Benning, Georgia for training because Canada did not have a parachute school. Uh, on our way down to Fort Benning, we had a stop over in Washington, D.C., and they took us through the capital. And it was a real high, high point in my life because they took us into the Senate chamber, and the Senate was debating that day on whether they should draft 18-year-olds or not. And they passed that bill that day. So I always felt pretty good about that, that I saw a piece of history taking place. So we got down to Fort Benning. Another interesting thing I didn't know about until, in fact, until this book came out this, uh, that was published about our unit. At that time, Canada's constitution said that no foreign officer could command any, com any Canadian unit. Now, we were going to train with the Americans down at Fort Benning. So they had to have a special meeting of parliament to pass a law just for that instance so that we could go work under the American officers. That was another piece of history. Anyway, we got down to Benning, and jump training was more physical training than jumping. The jumping part is easy. All you got to do is step out of that plane and it's all over. But the physical training they gave you was just horrendous. You wouldn't believe it. But I qualified for my wings on November 21st, 1942. They were pinned on me by Brigadier General Howell. I still have the original certificate and the original wings at home. And we stayed in Fort Benning till uh, just before Christmas. We were taking uh, combat training there. It was a good place to train. They had, you know, nice warm weather and plenty of places for, they had, uh, Fort Benning is a huge big fort. Tank units, infantry, everything else there. So it was a good place for us to train. And at Christmas time, they gave us a leave to go home. And then we were supposed to report back to Toronto, which I did. We got to Toronto and they shipped us to Shiloh, Manitoba. And Shiloh, Manitoba is about as flat as this floor. We used to say you could see a train coming three days before it got there. <laughs> that's how flat it was, it really was. And that's where they decided to set up the Canadian school. Uh, they found out later it was a poor place to have it because of the high winds there. Uh, it caused a lot of, lot of casualties. But that's where we trained. I took my, we jumped there and I, I uh, 
qualified for the Canadian wings. And in March of 1943, they gave us all a 10-day leave home. Uh, that's very unusual for them to give you 10 days for no reason at all. We had no idea why we were getting a leave. So we went home when we reported back. That's when we found out we were going overseas. They wouldn't let you know ahead of time when you were going. So then uh, they shipped us from there. We went to Halifax, Nova Scotia, went to England. We were, we were in a place called uh, Bulford Camp. It's on a Salisbury Plain, which is in the southern part of England. That's where the Roman burial mounds are and where the Stonehenge is. In fact, uh, when we used to go out on our forced marches, we'd go by the Stonehenge every time we went by that area. And then from there, they shipped us up to Ringway, England, because we had to qualify with the British for their wings. Because we were going to jump with the British, we were assigned to the British 6th Airborne Division. Now, the British jumped entirely different than the Americans and Canadians did. They jumped out of a hole in the bottom of the plane rather than out the door. And the only planes they had for training paratroops were the old Whitley bombers, which were an old World War I bomber. They flew all of 90 miles an hour, I guess. <laughs> and they had a fuselage that was probably about that high. You couldn't stand up in it. And the way we jumped out of that plane, we'd scooch in, sit down on our butts and scooch along the side till you got to the hole in the floor. Then you'd hook up and you had to swing into the hole in the floor. And you sit there, wait for the command to jump. Jump master hollers and you lift yourself up on your hands and pull your chin in, otherwise you'll hit it on the other side of the hole. And on one of our jumps, my good friend Bill Muir, he was ahead of me, he swung into the hole and was just ready to go, and I grabbed him and pulled him back. He said, what's the matter? Jump master says, what's going on? I said, he didn't even hook up. Just, you get so excited, you forget things. So he never forgot that. He just died last year. Uh, he and I were very good friends. And then uh, while there, too, we had to make two jumps out of a barrage balloon. I don't know, you kids probably have no idea what a barrage balloon is. Well, they're a huge, big balloon, fully as long as this room. It's like a big old sausage. And what they used them for primarily, they put them up over the main cities on cables. They sent them up about seven or 800 feet. This would deter the dive bombers from coming in too low. It, it helped a lot. It didn't stop it, but it did help a lot. So they took, these, they took one of these balloons and they hung a huge, big wicker basket under it, cut a four-foot hole in the floor, and they put eight of us in it, sent us up on a cable. We had to jump out of that. That was quite a unique feeling because we had never jumped out of a so-called free fall. Because when you jump out of a plane, you get the prop wash, which kind of pushes you back and opens your chute. This, you plummet right straight down. And we're only up there about 700 feet. And we had to make one day jump and one night jump. And the reason they did that, they thought they might be able to float us across the channel with these barrage balloons. But they gave that up because they couldn't figure out how to steer the dumb things because you're at the mercy of the wind, of course. <laughs> So they gave that up. And from then on, it was all combat training. We didn't, we used to go on, we called them schemes. Uh, the, the Americans always call them maneuvers. Uh, and the British, they always call them schemes. We were on schemes all the time. Out in the, drop us everywhere, just uh, all kinds of, just intense combat training. And uh, we knew, we had been told that we were going to be the spearhead for the Normandy invasion. We didn't know when, but we knew that's what we were being trained for. And lo and behold, it turned out that we were. The British 6th Airborne Division and the Canadians were some of the first troops to land in France on D-Day. We were sent to a, after our training, we were sent to a place called Down Anthony. And that's where the aerodrome was, where we were going to be taking off for France. I, I got to back up here a little. You know, when we speak of D-Day, we always mean the Normandy invasion. But D-Day in reality is just a code name for any day, any specified day that a military operation is going to take place. And then the hour that it's going to take off is H hour. So it's D-Day, H hour. But because of the size of the Normandy invasion, the immensity of it, the biggest military operation in history. When we speak of D-Day now, everybody means Normandy invasion, June 6, 1944. And it's been called the longest day, too. Uh, and, and Cornelius Ryan, when he wrote his book, titled his book The Longest Day. 
and I couldn't figure out where he got that title until I read his book. And in it, he has a direct quote. And it says, uh, believe me, Lang, the first 24 hours of the invasion will be decisive. The fate of Germany hangs in the balance. For the Allies, as well as Germany, this will be the longest day. Signed, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel, April 22, 1944. So they knew that we were coming, but they didn't know when. That was the big secret. So they sent us to a place called Down Anthony. What we got there, they put us in a camp completely surrounded by barbed wire with guards with orders to shoot anybody that tries to get in or out. No questions asked. Because we were the ones that knew when D-Day was coming. We had been told when it would be. June 5th was the original date. We were there for approximately two weeks while there we were training. They had the barbed wire camp about a half mile out on our perimeter, the Provo Marshal's Corps, had troops guarding the whole area, not to let anybody in or out. You'll never believe it. Two teenage girls not only got by the Provo Marshals, they got right up to the barbed wire. They took them prisoners and kept them for almost two weeks after the invasion. Because they, you know, they, we, they thought they might know something of what was going on. Can you imagine their poor parents as kids went off to school, didn't show up again? But I always said that the young girls always knew where the good looking guys were. <laughs> anyway, June 4th, oh, while in Don Ampney, <clears throat> they set up a huge tent, similar to a big top at the circus. And in it, they had these huge big pictures that were taken by the Air Force of the areas we were going to be in. And they had blown them up like six or eight feet. You just wouldn't believe it. They were hanging on the flaps of the tent. And in the tent, they had it all blacked out. You walk in in the daylight, and it was just pitch black in there. And then they turn on these low lights to make it look like a moonlight night. And in the center of the tent, they had these tables set up, and they had these topographical maps on them of the areas that we were supposed to hit. And each one of our units had their own table, showed our <coughs> objective. The one for our unit was a bridge and a chateau that held a radio station. Those were our two main objectives. And you wouldn't believe these pictures. I'll tell you, they had such detail in them, I couldn't believe it. You'd swear you were right there. How they could blow them up that big is beyond me, but they did. They did a terrific job. So we went through all our briefings. They came around the day before, handed us one sheet of paper, said, you have to write your last letter. What do you mean your last letter? Well, you have to write this letter as if you know you're going to die and you're never coming back. And you're allowed to write one, that's all. And then address it to who you want. And if you come back, we'll give you the letter back. If you don't come back, we'll mail the letter. Well, it's very difficult writing a letter when you don't know what's going to happen. And you got to pretend you're dead. <laughs> it's a difficult thing. I was fortunate I got my letter back. Well, June 5th came, they started, took us out to the aerodrome, and then the jump was called off because of the weather. <coughs> they had to cancel. So then we were put on forced rest. They make you try to lie down to get some rest. And then June 6th, dawn and we were told that, or not June 6th, June, for the evening of June 5th, they told us we're ready to go. Lotus, went to Lotus on the aircraft. Now, you just wouldn't believe, I got to tell you what we carried. In fact, they quoted in the book here. Uh, it's easier for me to read it than to recite it. He says, on June 5th, as it dawned cloudy, and as the sun set, the men dressed and loaded up. It is astonishing that they could walk after their final exercise, Ted Kalicki recalls. And I told him, I said, I thought many times of what we had carried with us on that drop. My memory is pretty clear on a point. I had two, so I had sewn two bandoliers of 303 rifle ammunition on my smock, on my Denison smock. Do you folks know what a bandolier of ammunition is? It's a web belt, and there's 100 rounds of rifle ammunition in it. I had two of those, one on each side of my smock sewn on, and I crisscrossed one each way this way. I also crisscrossed two more on my shoulders. We had felt bags which we strapped to our legs. This was unique. We had, we had uh, pioneered this. They had a big felt bag that went around our leg, and it clipped on here in three places with a, with a uh, cano wire through it for a ripcord. 
had a 20-foot cord on it, nylon cord that we tied to the seat of our harness. We loaded that with whatever we wanted, as I say in there. And when you jumped, when you thought you were about 40 feet from the ground, you would release that and lower the cord. Now, if you let it go too soon, it would tend to act as a pendulum. And in fact, in training, one of our guys got it going too quick. And boy, I'll tell you, he was really swinging. He approached the ground, the bag went up, he hit the ground, the bag came right down on top. About 150 pounds, just about killed him. But it was, a, it was a very good thing because uh, we had all our equipment with us. Anyway, I had the two bandoliers and the ones on my shoulder. We had the felt bags, which we could release with a ripcord and then lower, lower from us on a 20-foot nylon cord. The bag held our 303 Lee Enfield rifle, more 303 ammunition, some phosphorus, phosphorus grenades, several sticks of plastic high explosive, a couple of two-inch mortar shells, several hand grenades, in our backpacks, we had a change of underwear, socks, three-day supply of field rations. Our field rations were terrible. We had corned beef and hardtack. And when they say hardtack, it's like cement, believe me. We think it was left over from the First World War. And we had uh, hard candy. We had three tins of cigarettes, ten in each tin. And then whatever else we wanted to carry. We carried plastic tube. We carried a plastic tube in there so that we could put the plastic explosive in to make a Bangalore torpedo. Now a Bangalore torpedo, you generally slide under a wall or something to blow it or stick it alongside a building to blow the building down. And we were told to take as much ammunition and gear with us as we could because it would be at least three days before they would be able to resupply us. So that's why we carried so much. We had, uh, we just had anti-tank mines in there. I carried some Bren magazine guns in there. Ren gun magazines in there. We got to the aerodrome, ready to load, and believe me, we could hardly walk. And we got to the aircraft. It's not like now when you go to the airport, you walk out of the, you walk out of the building at the airport, you walk right into the airplane. These aerodromes that I'm speaking of didn't even have concrete runways. They were just dirt. That's where they took off from. Most most of the bombing raids and everything was taken off of fields of just open fields. <laughs> Here the entrance to the aircraft is about that high off the ground. They got two handles here to grab a hold of and a square step here. Well, you put your foot up and there's no way we could pull ourselves in and a guy on each side of the doorway put their hands on our butts and just literally threw us into the plane. So I was the second man in the aircraft because I was going to be next to the last out. We took off. It was dark. And we flew around quite a while because they had to rendezvous with other, other airborne units in the area that were taken off from different parts of England. Then we struck out over the channel, and when we got over the channel, it was a, it was a moonlight night, but not bright moonlight, but we could see all the silhouettes of the ships down there, all the different sea-going craft. It was just black with, with sea craft. <coughs> and then as we approached the French coast, they knew we were coming then because of all the activity. And I'll tell you, you talk about a 4th of July, you never saw a 4th of July like this one. There was so much anti-aircraft fire and small arms fire, tracer bullets, and we're going in at 800 feet. And a lot of these pilots had never faced small arm fire. They are flying way above the clouds and they, they fly through anti-aircraft, but not through what they were flying through in this. And I guess a lot of them panicked. Two of our plane loads were dropped 90 miles away from our drop zone, right on the middle of an airfield in La Havre that was held by the Germans. Quite a few plane loads were dropped over swampy areas. I found out later that we were dropped roughly 19 miles away from where we were supposed to be. We're flying along, and you know, the red light came out fire that was going on was just unbelievable. I don't know how our plane didn't get hit, but we were lucky. We, our plane didn't get hit. The red light came on, which means stand up. So we stand up and hook up. Green light comes on, jump master is back by the door, how it go? Tell us start taking off. The guy in front of me gets to the door, and I'll tell you, I never saw anything like it. He would not go. He fell to the ground. He grabbed the seats. I swore he was going to tear him right off the wall of the plane. He was screaming. He just there was no way was he getting out of that plane. 
I turned to Evans behind me. I said, are you with me? He says, yes, let's get the hell out of here. So I got, I don't know how I got over I think I stumbled out of the plane, but I got out. My chute opened and I look around. It's like a 4th of July around there, but there's nobody around. I'm all alone. I can't see the aircraft I just exited. It's gone. I don't see anybody else. I'm all alone. I don't know whether Evans got out. I hit the ground, had a good landing, good soft landing, surprisingly. Collapsed my chute, pulled in my gear. My heart's pounding 90 miles an hour. I don't know where I'm at. I don't know what's going on. Nobody's around. When you're all alone, it's a terrible feeling. <laughs> I pulled my bag over, got my rifle out, cradled it across my arm, got some of the grenades out, put them in my web belt. Just then I happened to see some movement over here. And I don't know who it is because it's dark. So I took a grenade, hooked the ring over my finger here, held the grenade like this, got the rifle here. And I'm laying there thinking if they're Germans, the only thing I can do is pull the pin and throw the grenade and get off as many rounds as I can and it's goodbye Ted. So. They got to, oh, I don't know, probably like from here to where that table is. And they stopped because that's when they saw me. I was trying to get as low on the ground as I could. I was hoping they were our own, but I was afraid they were Germans. And then one of them started toward me while the others held their weapons pointed toward me. And as he got closer and closer, I said, well, this is going to be it. And I don't know, he got probably like the second row here. And he looks and he says, blimey, it's a blooming Canadian. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you, you talk about a happy person. So I said, where's your CO? He said, he's back here with us. So I went back and they had a, the colonel was with him, one of their colonels. And I told him who I was. I was with the Canadians. And I said, do you know where my troops are, where my chaps are? He says, we're strung out all over. He says, I don't even know where most of my unit is. He says, this is the worst buckle up I've ever seen. Just terrible. So I said, uh, have you any idea where our DZ is? Because I should get back there. He said, well, you know, if you want, you can go with us if you'd like. I said, well, that's, I was told that no matter where we were, we should get back to the DZ because they would need all the troops there that they could get. He said, well, that's right, you should. So he said, strike off in that direction. That's the right direction to go. He said, I know that. But he said, I don't know how far away we are. He said, I have no idea. There's no familiar landmarks, nothing. So I struck out on my own. And after two or three minutes, I thought it was a mistake because then I turned around, I looked, and I'm all alone again. <laughs> I thought I should have stayed with them. At least I was with somebody. But I, I, when I say I struck out, I mean, this is you're running, you're crawling, any way you can to stay out of sight. And I got to a little wooded area, and I dropped on the ground, and I heard click. We had these clickers. And if somebody approached, you were supposed to give them one click, and they were supposed to reply with two if they were friends. Well, somebody went click, and I went click, click. Boy said, who is it? I said, clicky. He says, this is Evans. I said, oh, my God, am I glad to hear you. So I told him what had happened, who I had met with. He said, well, that's good. Let's, let's head in that direction. So he didn't. In the meantime, we picked up some other stragglers that had been dropped in the area. There were probably eight or nine of us by now. I don't, I don't remember the numbers. Didn't pay much attention to the numbers, just as long as you had a crew with you. And we came to a lane that had a stone wall on it. We were approaching it, crouched low. We heard, we heard Germans approaching from the left. So we got behind the wall, got grenades ready. I'll tell you, a grenade is the best weapon a soldier can carry. It's the greatest thing they ever had. We all got a grenade ready, and Evans, Evans was our sergeant. He says, when I say go, just jump up and get the grenades off fire as much as you can. Quietly, of course, we're all saying this. They're moving up. There were quite a few of them. We don't know how many, but there were quite a few. We waited till they were just about... We figured they had the area covered, Ted Hallard, now, and we jumped up and threw our grenades and fired, and then we took off. And you never heard so much screaming and moaning. I, I think we did a hell of a number on them. But we didn't stay to find out because we knew we were outnumbered. And we took off. We're moving through a wooded area, and again we hear some troops coming from the right. So we all hit the dirt. The cover in there was about that high. We're laying in the cover. Of course, we're all camouflaged. And here they come from the right. They're walking along, very unconcerned. Apparently, they didn't expect any troops to be in that area. Heading to our left, which was toward the north, we figured. Well, I swear they weren't any more than from here to that machine away from me. And they never saw us. I couldn't believe they couldn't see us, but I guess 
They never expected anybody there, so weren't looking for anything. We were all laying there perfectly still in that grass. Well, the same procedure. When they got by us, grenades, rifle fire, and then take off again. And later on, another incident, we came out of a woods, and this was a hay field, pretty high. And there was a building off in the distance, probably three, four hundred yards. We didn't know what it was, couldn't tell what it was, whether it was a barn or a house or what. But we thought we'd make for that building. And we'd start, you know, jump up and run away and drop down. Our sniper, Bastion, he had a scope on his rifle. And I don't know why he did it, but he wanted to get up and see what was going on. And he did it before we even knew that he was going to do it. But he stood up and he held his rifle up so he could look through the scope. That's as far as he got. We never heard the shot. We heard the thud, and he just collapsed. And I'll tell you, whoever that person was that shot at him was a hell of a shot because that was over 200 yards and got him right through the heart. But I got thinking afterwards, he was probably sighting on us as we were jumping up in the grass and moving up. So he probably had an idea where somebody was going to jump up. But regardless, it was one hell of a shot. But that was the first one of my comrades that I had actually seen shot dead in front of me. And I want to tell you, when you see all these movies about how they get blown against walls and they fly here and they fly there, it doesn't happen that way. They just collapse. That's it. The life is gone. That is if it's a fatal hit. So we got out of there because there was no sense of approaching. We had no idea who was there. Went back in the woods. And through the day, that's all it was. Skirmish after skirmish. Constantly. Came evening. We came upon a barn. One of the guys ran in, said it was all clear. Quietly, we moved into the barn. There were two horses in there, horse stables. We laid down to get some rest. Nice and warm in there. I don't know how long we were there, probably five, six hours getting some rest. Then we took off. It was a couple days later we found out from some fellows that came in the same area we were that approached that barn at daylight. They just got into the barn, they heard some movement upstairs, so they waited, and as they came down, they took each one prisoner. They took something like nine or ten German prisoners. They'd been up there in the haymow while we were down below, and neither of us knew that they were there. The other one was there. <laughs> Nobody ever made too much noise because you didn't want to make noise. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was quite an incident. I forgot, during that day, too, we came upon a road and there were some of our boys there that had a, a Bren gun set up. A Bren gun is our light machine gun. It's like the Browning on AR here that they use. It's a very good weapon. It's, a, it's actually a Czech, Czechoslovakian weapon. One of the best during the Second World War. And they had a Bren gun set up and some rifles there and they, they told us that they had somebody was, the Germans were coming toward them and through this field in front of them. They were on a kind of a mound by the road. So Clancy was with them and he said, uh, they had, there was a British commander with him. He told the commander, there was a sergeant, he told the commander, he said, take a look in one of the other guys with you and go down around here, see if you can on flank them, see how many men there are there, if you can. So we took off down the side there, and of course, same thing, you're crouching, you're crawling, whatever you can. Finally, we got down the road about probably 75 yards or so, and we laid there, and we'd see the Germans jumping up and moving forward, just like we do. And we determined there were quite a few of them there, more than we wanted to tangle with. But anyway, same procedure, got grenades ready, commander says, wait for my signal. And they're getting pretty close to us, I don't want to wait. I figure, let's open it, no, he says, wait, wait, well, my gosh, they got to where I figured I could reach out and touch one of them. Then he hollered, go. We let the grenades fly, fired, and when we did, the boys that we came from, they opened up too. We ran back to where they were, and surprisingly, the Germans retreated. And they determined later there was almost a company of them there. But because of us hitting them from the side and our troops opening up, they thought we had a full cordon there. Just out bluffed them, I guess. But the one sad thing there, uh, our Bren gunner there, uh, when Clancy hit his leg, so he'd fire, he didn't fire. Hit him again, he didn't fire, he rolled him over, he had a bullet right through his forehead. Nobody even knew he was hit, he was laying right there by his gun. So that's the way things happen. I had three close shaves, and I was very blessed. I must have had a guardian angel on each shoulder, because I don't know how I got through it. 
The one time I was, we set up a bread and position in a bombed out building and I was standing there watching the road behind the gun and one shell hit behind me in the courtyard. Don't know where it came from, don't know whether it was friendly fire or enemy fire. And I got hit right in the leg. I went down. I thought I lost my leg. I couldn't believe the pain. But I reached down and I said, hallelujah, I'm going to England because if you got it, if you got wounded, they shipped us back to England. That's all we wanted was to get back to England. <laughs> hallelujah. I looked, no blood. And I'm hurt like you wouldn't believe. And I reach again, no blood. And I pull my pants, there's a piece of shrapnel about that big, and hit my pants, drove right into the skin. Had the pants creased right into the skin. I couldn't believe it. And I was so black and blue here for about a week, you wouldn't believe it. And hurt. Oh. But that was it. And another time, Huey and I, Huey Mooring and I, who was a good friend of mine, we, were, we had set up a brand gun position to guard, the, guard our area. I had shallowed out a little slit trench. We didn't dig foxholes, we dug slit trenches. That deep, that's good enough. Just as long as you get below the ground level, that's all you need. Because if you get a direct hit, no matter how deep it is, it's going to kill you anyway. All you're trying to do is get away from shrapnel and gunfire. And I was lying there, taking a little rest. He was on a Bren gun. All of a sudden, he kicked me. So I get up in a crouching position. Here comes this big mass moving toward us down the road. And it's moving so slowly, you have to look to make sure that it's moving. And what, what they did, they had taken brush of all kinds and covered their weapons carrier. We knew they were enemy because that was enemy in front of us. There were no friends in front of us. So I said to Huey, as soon as you're ready, you let go of the bread and gun, I'll throw a couple grenades. So I got a couple grenades ready and he waited, oh, I don't know, they were, they were very close to us. No further than Tom is away from us before we fired, threw the grenades and fired. And I'm firing with my rifle and all of a sudden I look up and here's a big German coming at me with a bayonet. Well, again, I, I was fortunate. I got him before he got me, but that was scary. And uh, we cleaned out the whole bunch. It was a reconnaissance group, so that was a that was a good feat. Another time, we were storming a chateau. We had to approach the chateau on an open road. And as soon as we got within range, they started firing. So we're trying to make it to the other side of the road to stay out of sight, and. Sergeant Green would holler your name, and when he does, you have to dart across the road and hit for the other side. There came a lull in the firing, and I was Kalicki, and I jumped up, and about halfway across the road, the damn machine gun opened up again, and I made a dive. I probably dove from here to the wall, and I hit the dirt, and I'm laying there like this, and here come the bullets. And I said, goodbye, Mama. Last one hit right there. Just barely drew blood and stopped. One more bullet would have gone right through my head. And that's why I say I just, I had to be blessed. Same man, Huey, and I were out setting up a Bren gun position again. We stopped for a little rest to have a smoke. We were digging a big trench to put the gun in, fortify it. <laughs> I, I had some Lucky Strike cigarettes. I pulled out one. I, Lit it up and I said, Huey, would you like an American cigarette? Yeah, he said, I'll have one. So I gave it to him and put it behind his ear. And I said, what are you doing that for? He said, well, I'm going to smoke it later. And jokingly, I said, you better smoke it now because you may not get a chance later. You know, ha, ha, ha. And I no sooner got the words out of my mouth than a shell hit one lousy shell again. I don't know what, what it was with us. We always got one shell. It blew me through the air. And I'm laying there because I'm expecting more artillery. Waited, nothing, and I look over and who he's laying there, and I call to him and he doesn't answer. I call to him, he doesn't answer. Now, we had been sitting there like this. And I slithered my way over to him, I rolled him over, and he just let a little groan on him. He had a big hunk of shrapnel right through his heart. So again, I mean, I, I just don't know how I was that lucky. I had to be blessed. I don't know why I was saved, but I was grateful, of course. And that, that's the way it went all through. Uh, we were 93 days on the front line. When they originally dropped us, we were supposed to be in front line combat for 48 hours. They were going to withdraw us and drop us again further inland. Well, it never came to pass. We went all the way up through. We got to Ostend, Belgium. 
I was separated from the unit there. I was sent to the hospital, and then I was assigned to the uh, Queen's Own Rifles, and I was in Nijmegen when the Battle of the Bulge was on. Nijmegen is just outside of what the Americans refer to as the Battle of the Bulge. Nijmegen was just as big a battle, not as probably not as big because it didn't have as many men, but just as vital. And then uh, we were finally taken out of combat 90, 93 days later. And I'll tell you, I never thought England could look so beautiful. But it sure was. It was a very beautiful sight. And you know, for every one of us that got away the way I did, there were so many thousands that never made it. People just don't realize how horrible war is. When you see bodies laying around, and they're, you know, they're, they're your friends and they're the enemy, but they're still bodies, it makes you realize what it's all about. Limbs blown off. Johnson, a good friend of mine. We were behind a hedgerow. We were being shelled. And they're just shelling the living hell out of us. And we're laying there, and I'm laying this way, and he's facing me the same way. And all of a sudden, he looks at me and grins. He says, hey, Ted, you know what? I said, what? He says, this is just like being on the front line. I said, you dummy, where the hell do you think you are? We're way in front of the front line. It was about two seconds later he lost his leg. Just unbelievable. Just uh, hard to believe. Uh, our Canadian unit did something that most of the other units never did. We used to set up what we called listening posts. Now this is not a post of any kind. We used to try to get as close to the enemy as we could in the dead of night and just lay there and listen because you could hear what was going on. Not, not the speech, but to hear what's going on with the equipment. You might know whether they're prepare, preparing attack or maybe they're withdrawing or whatever. We did a lot of that. <clears throat> and one night, three of us were assigned to go out. That was, you know, you're laying on the ground trying to get a nap and all of a sudden the sergeant comes along, clicky, patrol. That's the worst thing you can hear because it means you're out there again. At least when you're on the ground sleeping, you're safe. Anyway, it was my, called me listening post, so we start out across this field, crawling and running, whatever we can. All of a sudden, one of us tripped a flare. I don't know who it was, but I'll tell you, in the dead of night, when a flare goes up, it lights it up like the football stadium. So we hit the dirt and lay there. I surely expected they were going to open up on us, but they didn't. So we waited probably 10 minutes, just laying there perfectly still. And then we crawled up closer, and then we could hear all kinds of activity. They were, mo they were moving horses. They used a lot of horses, by the way. The German army used an awful lot of horses. We could hear the horses moving. We could hear the wagons rolling. And so we determined that they must be pulling out. I guess what they thought when the flare went off, they probably thought that there were going to be more of us coming. And they were in the process, apparently, of moving out anyway, but they just speeded it up. So we laid there for a while. It got deadly quiet. We thought, well, now we'll head back. Never got to go, I'll tell you. They apparently pulled back and zeroed in on that position because they figured, I guess they figured we would be coming through that area. And they laid down an artillery barrage in the den of night. And I'm telling you, when you lay there on the ground and this flame is shooting up seven, eight feet next to you, the ground is shaking. <laughs> Anybody that says they're not scared is lying like hell. Because you try your damnedest to dig as low into that ground as you can. And it's, that's the way it is with everybody that's on that front line. You talk to any man that's faced mortal combat, he'll tell you the same thing. All you can think of is to get down as low as you can on that ground. Get the hell out of the way. But uh, that, was, that was just another one of the instances. That's the way the whole battle went. The whole thing. I was very proud to be a part of it. I would never want to go through it again. In fact, our Brigadier General Gale, British General, the night before we went in, he gave us a big rally speech, like we were going out to play football. He, was, he walked with a staff, looked just like a shepherd, you should see him. Very heavy British accent. I used to be able to mimic him, but I can't do it anymore. I've lost that now. I lived with them for four years, so I got to speak just like him. In fact, when I met my wife, she thought I was a Canadian. That's why she wanted to meet me. <laughs> night I met her, I told her I was going to marry her, and I did, 52 years ago. <laughs> so, that was funny. But uh, he gave us a speech, and he said, uh, My comrades tell me that I must be crazy taking green troops into combat. 
And he said, I told them that I would take green troops any time. Of course, we stood up, hooray! Of course, two minutes after we were in France, we knew why he wanted green troops. Because <laughs> if you knew what it was like, it wouldn't be so hot to go. We just couldn't wait to get into combat, really. It was unbelievable. But once we got in, it was a different story. But once you're in, you have to do your duty. That's all you can do. So that's about as much as I like to tell you, except that uh, there is a book about our battalion. It's called Airborne. It's in the Richmond Memorial Library because I dedicated it to my son who died two years ago. And it's a historic story of the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion. And this is an autographed copy by the author, Brian Nolan. He interviewed me several times, had me make tapes. And he told me one thing. He went to France to do some research on the book. And he told me, you know, when you told me about the hedgerows there, I didn't believe you till I got there. Because when you people speak of hedgerows, you're talking about these little hedges. Well, those hedgerows in Normandy, they were used to separate the lots of the, of the French farmers. And what they had done over the years, they had cleared their land, thrown the brush and dirt in these areas to fence off their areas. Well, by the time 1942, those hedgerows, the bases of them were probably six, seven feet high, 10, 12 feet through, and a brush and a bramble on them, a wild hog couldn't get through. In fact, the tank corps could not get through. They couldn't get through those hedgerows. And one Canadian engineer, took a bulldozer and welded eight foot long railroad irons onto the blade. That's how they got through the hedgerows, ripped them up with that. They couldn't break them, break them any other way. And another thing too, you know, we had some great weapons, but let me tell you, that German 88, that was one of the worst weapons a person could face. And to this day, it's still one of their best weapons. They had them mounted on carriers, we call them SPs, self-propelled. They had them on their tanks. The first day, we saw three Sherman tanks to the south of us. They just came around a hedge. There was a Tiger tank sitting there. We didn't know the tank was there, but we just heard the 80s. You can hear the 88s. Why, they have a very distinct sound. It sounds like you're ripping a piece of galvanized steel. It's terribly demoralizing when they're firing at you. One shot, boom, blew the turret right off that tank, just like nothing. Another tank pulled up. You got three of them within a minute and a half. We didn't have anything to, to, to stand up against those 88s until a little while later. It was unbelievable. And they'd pull up and uh, they could get so close to you and they'd fire those things point blank range and the sound alone was enough to make you go nuts. It was unbelievable and very accurate. They were a terrible weapon. So, but there's one thing I'd like to uh, read to you. This is a citation that was, this is a copy of the citation that was presented to the British 6th Airborne Division. It says, what manner of men are these who wear the maroon beret? They are firstly all volunteers and are toughened by hard physical training. As a result, they have that infectious optimism and that offensive eagerness which comes from physical well-being. They have jumped from the air and by so doing have conquered fear. Their duty lies in the van of the battle. They are proud of this honor and have never failed in any task. They have the highest standards in all things, whether it be skill in battle or smartness and execution of all peacetime duties. They have shown themselves to be uh, tenacious in defense as they are courageous in the attack. They are, in fact, men apart, every man an emperor. Of all the... Of all the of all the fortune which make for success in battle, the spirit of the warrior is the most de de desired. That spirit will be found in full measure in the men who wear the maroon beret. It's signed Field Marshal the Viscount Montgomery of Alamein. And that's a citation he gave to the 6th Airborne Division after the Normandy invasion. So we were very proud of that. In fact, our unit has four battle honors on our flag uh, we never failed in any any objective that was given to us. We took every objective that was assigned to us. Maybe not in the time allotted, but we did make it. Then there's just one other thing I'd like to read. This is a poem that was dedicated to the 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion by a poet by the name of Harold Mohn, M-O-H-N. He lives in Pennsylvania. 
And it says, we came back from the depths of hell we did not think could be, with memories that have scarred our minds to last eternally. The stench of blood and dirt and sweat with a, with a, will always with us stay. The sight of wounded, dying dead, we cannot drive away. We learned a devastation that only war can bring. We know how in the battle, how close to life we cling. We cannot forget our comrades who lie across the sea. And were but for the grace of God, we too with them might be. We pray our sons who follow will never know or see the nightmare of another war and its futility. And that last line is right. You know, I, I never forget what Winston Churchill said. He always said that yak, yak, yak is a lot better than war, war, war. And believe me, it is. We always, I've always been of the thought now that when I hear these hawks, we got to go in and get them. I said, I'll be the first one to follow you. And that usually stops them. Because none of them want to go, but they want us to go. I'm not saying that, that, I'm not saying that a lot of wars aren't necessary. They are because of what happens. But it's not a pleasant thing to ask the young men and women, today the women, to sacrifice their lives for something that should be able to be worked out with treaties. But it has to be. So that's about the end of my presentation. Oh, before I quit, here's a picture of the, my company that I jumped with. These are the original guys I went in with. Not many of them left. But that was sent to me by uh, Lieutenant Clancy, oh, about six years ago. I didn't even know he had it, so that made me feel pretty good that I got it. Are there any questions? You must have some questions. How soon did you tell your parents where you were? Well, that was funny. <laughs> I didn't tell them it was forced out of me. <laughs> I was in the barracks in Toronto. I was in the bar barracks in Toronto. This is, this was, oh, toward the first part of February. And uh, it was at night time. We were sitting there shooting the breeze. And two Mounties came in. Is there a Kaliki here? I said, yes, yeah, right here. What the hell have I done? I haven't done anything. So you Theodore Kaliki? Yes. Live on 17 Maple Street, Batavia, New York? I said, I did, yes. Okay. Your mother and father know you're here, right? Oh, yeah. Well, I think you better come with us. I had no idea what they wanted. So they took me into Colonel's office. <clears throat> Colonel says, how old are you? I said, I'm 21. <laughs> no, he said, we know you're not 21. He said, how old are you? I said, I'm 18. Well, he said, if your parents knew you were here, how come your father is writing this scathing letter to Ottawa? He was going to invade Canada to get me back. <laughs> but anyway, he said, uh, in Canada, you're of legal age. So he said, it's up to you. If you want to go back, we will give you an honorable discharge. If you want to stay, you're of legal age and you can stay. So I said, well, I do want to stay, but I wish I could get back and talk to them now as long as they know where I'm at. So he said, well, we'll give you a 10-day leave. Now, he said, when you get home, if you decide you don't want to come back, you have to come back or else you'll be a deserter. So, you know, if you want to stay there, fine, but come back and get your official discharge. So I came home and talked it over with my parents, and I told them I, I wanted to stay. So that's, that's when I found out. Henry finally told them because my mother, I didn't know it till later. My mother used to go down to the railroad station, sometimes stand there for hours expecting me to come back. If I'd have known what it did to her, I would have never done it. But when you're a kid, you know, you think of yourself only. So it was a bad thing to do for my mother. Were your parents supportive after you tell them, after you calmed down? Oh, yes, yes. In fact, <laughs> I came home on leave, and back then, uh, Canadian Army, we wore shorts, shorts and short sleeve khaki shirts and a pith helmet. And I was home on leave. That was the official dress. That's what I had to wear. I went to church with my mother, and she, she didn't know whether I should go to church or not with shorts on <laughs> to the Sacred Heart Church. But uh, she was very proud of me, of course, once I was in, and uh, all the people came out and talked to them. And, uh, yes, they were very supportive. Uh, but uh, my father used to listen to the radio every day, every day trying to keep track of where we were. All four of us boys were in. My, uh, one, one of my brothers was in the uh, Philippines. The other one served in Haiti. 
And one of them went to the Philippines, but it was after the war. He was in during wartime, but he was sent there after the war and then discharged while he was over there. So, and my older brother, Walt, I used to call him Tarzan, he was mad as could be when I went in because he wanted to be the first one in. And he never forgave me for beating him in the combat. <laughs> He's dead now, but he, he always was, he used to tell me, damn you, I could have killed you when I found out you were in the army. <laughs> Pardon me? Yeah, your brothers make it back home. Yes, yes. My mother was very thankful so all four of us came back. Uh, you know, during the war they had these uh, gold stars that they used to put in the windows of uh, houses where one of their children had died in battle in the war. And I'll tell you, everybody, this gentleman can tell you, there were a lot of them in the city of Batavia. In fact, I have a book at home that was dedicated to the gold star mothers. It has a picture of every one of those that was killed in combat and a little history about them. And some of those boys were 17 and 18, you know. Never even, never got to do anything. Because back then, like I tell you, we didn't have the freedom that you kids have today. Unless you were 17 or 18, there wasn't much you could do. Everybody watched you like a hawk. And you couldn't do anything, really, until you were 21. That was the age of consent. So, anything else? Yes. No, I tore it up. No, I wouldn't want anybody to see that. Because you bury your soul. <laughs> no, I didn't want anybody to see that. If I had died, that's a different story, but not to, no. If you would have known ahead of time what you would have had to go through, would you have done it again? That's a hard question. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, I know now that I wouldn't like to go through it again. But how would you know? That fellow that couldn't leave our plane, you know, not a one of us held anything against him. How could you? The poor guy was absolutely petrified. He went through all the training with us and everything. I mean, he was one of us. We never expected that to happen. But fortunately, he was the only one in our outfit. There could have been more, you know, that could have caused a serious problem for us. But we all saw him in England afterwards, and he apologized. We said, you no apology needed. I mean, you, you know, that's just one of those things. Could have happened to any one of us. Who knows how they're going to react in the face of fire. I've seen people run off the line, just petrified. You just don't know. You have no idea. Uh, one of our men, uh, Mark Lockyer, he was, he was dropped in a different area away from us, and when daylight broke, they, they got hit with heavy enemy fire. And there were a whole bunch of them knocked down in the field. And he was laying there. He was badly wounded. His leg was all shattered, bleeding. And here come the Germans. And they're walking along. There's an officer with them. He's rolling everybody over like this and putting a bullet through the head just to make sure that they're dead. And Mark said later on, after we got back to England, he said, I didn't know what to do. So he said, I took the blood and I smeared my whole, I, he was off in the back. They were working away at him over here. He said, I smeared my whole head, my face, and everything with blood, and then I rolled over on my stomach. He said, I was in terrible pain. Came to me, he said, they rolled me over and kicked me real hard in the stomach. And he says, I don't know how I kept from crying out, but I didn't. He said, he walked away. Why he didn't shoot, I don't know. There again. Did it to everybody except him. Why, you know, who gets the lucky draw? It's unbelievable. Just a matter of faith. But there were, uh, there were a lot of our boys that... Uh, I told you about these gliders. I'll tell you, it was the most horrible thing you could see. These gliders were supposed to be dropped in open areas. And again, apparently, the pilots panicked, let them go wherever they could. They hauled two of those gliders behind each plane. They would release the cable, and that glider is very heavy. It doesn't soar like these gliders you see nowadays. They'd right for the ground, and all they were trying to do was get down. Well, some of those would hit the ground and right into a big tree. And all this heavy equipment, just slammed right forward, took all the troops right with them. They never knew what hit them. Never knew what happened. And that wasn't only ours, but that was in the American side as well. You know, there was one unique thing about the British 6th Airborne Division. We had the British, we had the Canadians, we had Poles, we had French, we had Dutch, <laughs> we had Norwegians, we had everybody in that unit. They had all kinds of units. In fact, the, the, the uh, Polish battalion, 
I got so I visited them quite a bit, being Polish myself, I used to have a good time with them. But uh, we had quite a crew. We were very proud of our division. And uh, the British 6th Airborne, as well as the British 1st Airborne, we have an Airborne Brotherhood. That's the pin. And anywhere I go, anywhere in England or Canada, if I meet another paratrooper, they know that instantly. And we have a, uh, uh, over in England, one of the retired colonels is in charge of our unit. We donate money. Any time any one of our brothers is in dire financial straits, all he has to do is get a hold of him. He has carte blanche to go there and give him whatever he needs, whatever he determines they need. And we all donate to that. So it's, it's a very nice brotherhood. We're very proud of it. So, this is our regimental tie, ex Coelis, out of the clouds. In fact, that's what our history book is called. It's called Out of the Clouds. Anybody else? You're probably all anxious to get out of here. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you for having me.